So today I'm going to talk about bacterial aging and um, how it's uh, related to adaptability of bacteria. Um, right now I'm a postdoc in the Nelson Group at Princeton University, but um, the um, the project that I'm talking about is um, a project that I did during my PhD when I was at the University of Pittsburgh in the Salmon Group um, in the physics department. And we did this project in collaboration with um, Zoltan Altbay, who at the time was also at the University of Pittsburgh, but right now he's at the uh, med school at uh, Rochester University. So I wanna start by talking a little bit about adaptation in bacteria. Um, so when you put bacteria in a different um, environment, they can react differently. One example of the reaction that um, most of us are familiar with is a uh, chemotaxis. Uh, in this movie, there is a chemotractin in the lower right side of this chamber, and you can see that all the cells can move, uh, can swim towards uh, the chemotractant. Um, but um, in addition to that, cells can also adapt to their environment through different uh, mechanisms. For example, they can reorganize their metabolic network activity. And in this example um, that I'm showing here, if um, cells have a specific mutation, and if you put those cells in a specific kind of environment, they can change their metabolic activity somehow that they can um, increase their uptake of specific nutrients, for example, glycerol, or they can increase the production of specific uh, opt uh, uh, organic acids, for example, acetate and lactate. Um, uh, another example would be uh, where cells can undergo internal phase separation. Um, uh, in optimal growth conditions, there are um, biomacromolecular assemblies inside the uh, inside bacterial cells, and when um, and when they are faced uh, with stress or aging, these um, condensates can become more solid-like. Uh, so all these examples that I uh, that I have here, these are all non-genetic changes. However, if the uh, if the environment is changed for long enough, bacteria can also go through genetic changes for adaptation. And um, so, in this uh, example that I'm showing here, these are um, uh, mutations in one specific gene, and. Uh, Put and when you put these uh, mutation mut mutants in specific um, nutrient conditions, <clears throat> they can even be beneficial for the cells. And you can see in in these specific um, nutrient conditions, all these mutants have lower doubling time, which means they are growing more effectively or more faster compared to the wild type strain. Um, uh, so this was, um, looking at all of these, it was interesting for us to see, to um, understand why are some um, uh, uh, deleterious mutations beneficial for bacteria and how, how what is the uh, connection between mutation and um, uh, nutrient, uh, uh, the, the nutrients that uh, the environment is giving the cells. And so uh, to study this, we decided to use this um, KO collection. The KO collection is a collection of something around 4,000 muta mutations in um, single gene deletions of the non-essential genes of the um, E. coli K12 uh, strain. That um, this group uh, developed this uh, collection in 2006, and uh, the same group was also able to come up with a high throughput method that they could measure the uh, the growth parameters of the colonies of these bacteria. Uh, of all these 4,000 mutants, they were able to measure these um, uh, the growth can uh, the growth uh, parameters. And so uh, they measured three different um, three different parameters: the maximum growth rate or MGR uh, of the colony, the saturation point that the colony would grow to, and they call that SVG, and the lag time of growth, which is the time that it takes for the colony to go into exponential growth, and they call that LTG. And of these four thousand mutants that uh, they had, they they found that the, this number of mutants would have uh, different values or lower values compared to the wild type. 
uh, they would have uh, th this number. Th these um, these uh, cells would have lower SVG or slower NGR or longer LTG. And so we decided that we could uh, compare these mutants to the wild type to see what are the differences. And and um, oh, and these were all done on agar um, uh, on agar, which is a highly nutrition uh, media. Uh, however, we thought maybe if we use if we put these um, mutants in different ty types of uh, nutrition for as uh, the same as I showed you in the last uh, slide, maybe they will show diff uh, they will show even higher growth to wild type or similar growth to wild type. So today I will be talking about these two groups um, that showed lower uh, SVG and uh, slower MGR. And so the specific question that we were interested, as I mentioned, is that how are these mutation bearing cells can survive and continue to exist? For an extended time, and so we decided to take two different approaches for uh, to 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 answer this question. We um, first uh, measured the uh, or uh, yeah we me first measured the population growth of these um, different strains, and looked at the different parameters for population growth. And then later on, we started looking at the single cell growth. And today, we, I will mostly talk about the single cell growth. Of, uh, of one of these mutants, but in, in the beginning, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the population growth as well. And I'm gonna start about population growth. So we um, took a very standard um, approach to this. We looked at liquid microbatch cultures of 65 of these mutants. Uh, as I mentioned, this, this is the E. coli K12 BW25113 uh, strain. And um, we also, as I mentioned before, we were interested in looking at different um, uh, media conditions. So in this case, we uh, had three different media conditions. LB is Luria broth, which is a very nutritious media and wild type can grow very efficiently in this media. And then the second uh, media that we used is M9CG, which is minimal um, M9 minimal media plus cas amino acids plus glucose and wild type cells can grow, um, have, can have an average growth in this media. And the last one uh, is M9G, which is M9 minimal media plus glucose and wild type cells grow pretty slowly in this media. And so um, this is one type, uh, one example of the measurements that we did. This is wild type in LB. Uh, we measured the OD of uh, the <clears throat> liquid <clears throat> Microbatch culture over time, and then using and so we had this for all the three different uh, con media conditions and for all the mutants and using these uh, growth curves, we can measure different parameters. Um, we the first two parameters were the ones that I already mentioned: the maximum growth that the this curve. Um, uh, can take and then the saturation point of this growth and then we also took two other measurements um, from this other study uh, the first one is t exponential which is the time of the ex the time that the growth is in the uh, exponential phase and auc which is the area under this curve so overall we have uh, four different parameters and three different conditions that means 12 parameters per mutant and this is a lot of parameters so First thing we did is that we looked at the um, correlations between these parameters, and we found that there is a there is high correlations among many of these. So we thought maybe we can reduce the number of parameters, and we were and by doing a principal component analysis, we found that we could explain more than ninety five percent of the entire um, uh, entire data by using only two parameters. And here you're looking at all the um, all these mutants projected on the first two principal components and all the mutants, that the, all the 65 mutants that we used. And we also did a hier hierarchical clustering and we were able to cluster these into two uh, clusters. So one type here is the black dot and you can see that cluster two, um, uh, that most of the mutants are in cluster two, which means that they have a very similar growth compared to wild type while cluster one has a uh, different uh, growth. And all the mutants in cluster one are the ones that are, um, are in the sustained metabolic pathway. So these are a lot, but today I'm not gonna talk about all of this. I'm only gonna talk about a little bit about these um, ATP mutants that are part of the ATP synthase. And so I wanna explain what the, how the, what the ATP synthase is and what it does 
Um, so this is the enzyme ATP synthase that synthesizes ATP from ADP. It is inside, it is an intermembrane protein, so it's inside the, the inner membrane of bacteria. It has two different parts. Uh, F0 is the part that contains uh, these three subunits, A, B, and C. And then um, F1 is the this other subunit that it's in the cytoplasm and it contains alpha, beta, uh, gamma, epsilon, and delta subunit. And so these three subunits are responsible for moving the protons into, into the cytoplasm. And then these other um, subunits uh, synthesize ATP. And so if we remove each of these subunits, we can get a mutant, and then we can look at how that mutant is growing in these different uh, three different media conditions. For example, if we remove this alpha subunit, we get a mutant that is called ATPA. And um, then we can look at the growth in the three uh, media conditions. And in all the graphs that I'm going to show, the darker the darker uh, graphs are wild type and the lighter ones are the mutant. So we can see that in, in the nutrient uh, rich condition, which was LB as expected uh, from the previous study, there is a difference between the growth of mutant and wild type. However, if we uh, move these into um, less nutrient conditions, they have pretty similar growth compared to the wild type. And so we can look at other mutants as well. So if we re remove this A subunit, we can see a different behavior in, in, the, in the population. For example, we can see that the most difference uh, is in the less uh, nutrient condition. If we remove the C, this is how it reacts. The, all three have, um, have different uh, growth uh, growth. Uh, different growths. And um, if we remove this delta subunit, again, the most difference is in the LB condition. If we remove the B, um, the highest nutrition and the lowest nutrition have differences. And this goes on, we can remove each of these and look at the differences. And so uh, we decided if we want to look into very details of what is happening, we have to choose one of these. And we decided to look into this ATPA mutant, where we can, where it was very interesting that we can see that they have a difference in the uh, highly nutrition um, condition, but they don't have any differences in the low nutrition conditions. And so, um, so comparing this, um, uh, the ATPA to wild type, and uh, so uh, the only thing that I'm going to show to you about the population is uh, are these four uh, parameters that I, that I already talked about. And you can see that um, the same thing that you can see in the growth graphs, you can see that there is a lower difference in the M9G compared to LB. And so uh, I want to move on into the single cell dynamics from here on. Uh, and then at the end, I will try to kind of um, uh, co uh, connect the single cell dynamics to the population growth. So to study the single cell dynamics of the wild type and the delta ATPA uh, cells, we use this microfluidic device called the mother machine that I guess a lot of people in the, uh, in the audience here know about, but for the people who don't know about this, I am going to give a very short introduction of what this is. So this was a device that was, um, uh, that was developed in Suck June's group in 2010. And um, the device has a, a large channel and then some small channels that are perpendicular to the large channel. And uh, the way that it works is that we load a very high concentration of bacterial cells into the device. And then some cells can go into the smaller channels and we wash away the excess cells. And so the ones that are uh, trapped in these um, small channels, they, uh, since they have continuously continuous medium uh, provided to them, they can grow and divide. And then we can follow the growth and division of these cells. And it's called the mother machine because this cell that is trapped at the end um, is, is the mother cell because it, it creates the daughters. And here's a, one example of a video where this um, cell is trapped here and we can follow it for multiple generations. And we can measure the length of this cell and plot that versus time. 
And so um, each of these is uh, one generation. So the cell grows and then divides at this point and then so on. And um, I, I'm plotting this uh, in, uh, in uh, the y-axis as a log axis. And so you can see that we can fit each of these uh, generations to align pretty well, which means that the growth is exponential. And then using these, um, uh, these measurements, we can uh, measure we can uh, measure different parameters of the single cell growth. Uh, we can fit each line to this equation, x equals to x0 e to the alpha t, where x0 is the birth length, and we can so we can calc we can measure the birth length of each generation. So a small n here is the number of generation. We can also measure the slope of this line, which is alpha, which is uh, this, uh, which shows the exponential elongation rate, um, EER. So I'm going to use short abbreviations in my presentation. I will use BL as the birth, birth length, EER as the exponential growth rate. Uh, rate. And the last uh, parameter that I'm going to talk about is the time that it takes for the, each of these generations and um, uh, or the inverse of the time. And uh, we're, I'm going to call that DR, which is the doubling rate. And so the first thing that we measured was the doubling rate in each in all of these cells. And we compared that to the maximum growth rate. Uh, I, I just put here to remind you of what the uh, maximum growth rate of each of these were in the different condition, in the media conditions. Um, and this is for population. So MGR is the population growth rate. Um, and on the y-axis is for the single cell growth rate. And you can see that there's a high correlation between these two uh, values, which means that the, that the population growth is actually um, reflecting the single cell growth. And so um, previous studies have shown that when uh, cells are put in lower nutri nutrient conditions, their birth width and their birth length is decreased. And we can see that here as well. We can see that both in the, the mutant and in the wild type. And um, we can also see that the, um, the uh, doubling rate it has a high, high correlation with the birth length. So looking at these two, this means that the mutant cells are using the same homeostatic mechanisms as wild types. So they are decreasing their width and their length in the lower nutrient uh, condition. Um, and so the next thing that we looked at was the co uh, coefficient of variance, with it, which is the standard deviation divided by mean. And um, looking at this in, um, in the wild type cells, um, this agrees with previous studies. So previous studies have shown that the, co uh, that the CV of uh, wild type cells increases when the nutri nutrient becomes poor. Um, so we can see that the, it's increasing. And this means that the cells are um, uh, that the that the stress can increase uh, the growth rate variation, um, the, the the growth rate variation. And but you see that um, in the uh, high nutrition, there are some cells that are growing pretty fast, and these cells still exist in all uh, in all conditions. So there are cells that are still growing fast. However, if we look at the mutant cells, we can see that um, the, uh, we can see that the CV is not increasing that much uh, with nutrient with uh, nutrients. And so the cells that are growing pretty fast in the high nutrient condition don't exist anymore in the low nutrient conditions, um, uh, which means that uh, this um, decrease in the growth rate for or the doubling rate of the mutant is global, and that they are they are um, they are changing their homeostatic behavior compared to the wild type, and this is. Um, and so this is all caused due to the stress from the environment. So um, the three uh, parameters that I talked about uh, before, I'm going to show them um, in all of these cells. Uh, so uh, previous studies have shown that all these parameters are preserved over multiple generations in, in wild type cells and um, in mutant cells. Uh, and we saw the same thing here um, so let me explain what this generation number means and why it's negative. So we followed the cells in the mother machine until they 
could not divide anymore until, or or in other words, until their death. And since when the cells enter the, the, the channels in the mother machine, we don't know how many generations that they have gone before. So to sync these, we went backwards in time. So we took generation zero to be the death, the time of death of these uh, cells, and we synced them all uh, at this point. And we synced all the cells at this point. And so negative generation means before death. Well, actually, generation zero is the one generation before death. So it's the last division that the cell can go through. And so, um, uh, and so previous, as I mentioned, previous studies has shown have shown that the, the growth parameters are stable over hundreds of generations. And we saw the same thing that more than for more than 25 generations before death, the values of birth length for both the wild type and the ATPA are, uh, are the same. However, in the very last generations before the cells die, the birth length is increasing. Um, so this is uh, we and we see kind of the same thing in um, in the M9CG media, and then we see the same thing in the M9G media. <clears throat> so this was the birth length, and then we can measure the um, exponential growth rate again. Again, the same thing. It's pretty stable for for multiple generations, except for the last final generations, which is where it's decreasing. The same for um, M9CG and the same for M9G. And then um, the last parameter, which was the um, uh, doubling rate, we see the same thing. So it's uh, decreasing in the last final uh, generations of the cell cycle. So um, the next thing that we found that was pretty interesting was after the cell could not divide anymore. So here is a, an example of a cell that is in the uh, in one of those channels, and it after it goes the final division. So it uh, so this is the length of the cell throughout time. It divides until at some point it goes through the last division and it cannot divide anymore. So the length stays constant from here on. And we thought the cell might be dead at this point. Um, so to be able to um, uh, to understand whether what is happening to the cell, we use this uh, dye, propodium iodide, which can enter the cell once its membrane has disintegrated. And surprisingly, we saw that it did not enter the cell right after it stopped growing. Uh, but it took a pretty long time. In this case, it took around 10 hours before it would enter the cell. And so we, we found out that the cells are entering a post-replicative state after they, um, they have stopped growing. Uh, and then we, so we named this, uh, we named th this part of the, the lifetime of the cell as the ap apparent replicative lifespan. And we use the word apparent because we, again, we don't know how many uh, cycles the cell has gone through before it enters the channel. So this is the number that we can only, this is an only the numbers that we can count after it enters the channel. And then we, um, so at this point, it's the end of the apparent replicative life scan. And then after this, until the dye can enter the cell, we call that as the post-replicative lifespan. And then when the dye has entered the cell is where the cell has placed. And so we could measure the timing for, um, for these, uh, uh, for these cells, uh, so in the in these uh, graphs, each line is one single cell, and we can measure the apparent replicative lifespan and the post-replicative lifespan span for each of these. And we can see that um, the the post-replicative lifespan is increasing as the um, as the nutrients are becoming poor. And looking at uh, at the mutant and comparing it to the wild type, we can see that the apparent replicative lifespan is not um, is increasing a little bit, but uh, is increasing a lot in the LB condition, but not that much in these two conditions. However, the post replicative lifespan is increasing a lot. Um, so this is uh, the x-axis in all of these graphs here is time. 
uh, we did the same measurements, but this time in terms of um, generations, number of generations and set of time. And here's what, what um, is more interesting that although in terms of um, in terms of time, they are not so different, but in terms of number of generations and the uh, apparent uh, replicative lifespan, they are pretty, uh, they are very different. And so at this point, um, we looked at the transcriptome profiles for these, uh, for these different mutants um, and compared them to wild type. And the a specific um, uh, stress response gene that I want to talk about is RPOS, that uh, previously it has been shown that RPOS is activated in uh, nutrient-deprived uh, conditions or due to molecular damage. And um, RSSB is um, essential for degrading RPOS, uh, RPOS. So looking at the Maria, three... you have five minutes. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, looking at the three conditions, um, we can see that um, the mutant is changing. Um, so the, the, the parameter that is mostly important because RSSB degrades RPOS is the ratio between RPOS to RSSB. And we can see that the mutant in all conditions has an increased um, uh, expression of this um, of this ratio, which means that it's showing a stress response due to the, uh, it's showing a stress, stress response ir uh, irrespective of the nutrient condition, but also um, relative to the nutrient condition. And so um, lastly, uh, I want to talk about aging. I want to go into aging and how uh, aging is, um, has been, uh, so this idea is not very new, right? That aging is a, an adaptive strategy. So uh, we can measure the um, survival. So this has been shown before that we can measure the survival function of uh, cells in, um, in um, different conditions. And here are two examples of showing where um, the cells with, um, RP, with uh, um, RPOS, uh, a mutation can undergo higher, ha can have higher aging rates and a uh, different, and a uh, mutation in RSSB can have lower aging rates. And so we, um, we looked at the, the survival functions of the cells in, of the wild type and ATPA cells in different media conditions. And you can see that the values of the aging rate is increasing in wild type due to condition and also due to mutation. So both for um, for, nutri for uh, lack of nutrients and for a mutation, the aging rate is increasing. And another, so last thing that I wanna mention is are these um, uh, morphology phenotypes that we saw that the cells can undergo before death. Um, they, uh, so I'm gonna fast forward uh, the, uh, the movies. Um, so we saw three different phenotypes that I want to explain. The first one is um, a cell that we call phenotype 1A is where the cell is losing its chromosome during its cell division. So after it, uh, so here the green, the green is the chromosome and the red is the uh, PI dye. And you can see that um, uh, the cell is losing its chromosome during its last division. So phenotype 1B is the same as 1A. However, it's, it's, it keeps its chromosome during its last division. So you can see that after the last division, um, the GFP intensity is high. And then, and then the last one is a phenotype 2, where the cells are fil filamenting during the last division. And filamentation has been shown before that it's a very well-known stress response of uh, the cells two different conditions. You can see in this example where the cell is uh, filamenting. And um, so here is just uh, to um, see that more clearly, uh, phenotype 1A um, loses its chromosome, phenotype 1B uh, has its chromosome before lysis, and phenotype 2 is um, showing uh, 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 filamentation. And um, so we looked at the different ratios of these two different phenotypes in these cells. And we saw that in the high stress condition, in the M9G condition, they are both showing higher percentage of 
phenotype too, which means that this is a stress response. So the cells are changing their phenotypic, um, they are phenotypically changing due to the stress. And we can also look at the aging rate of these two different types. Um, and we can see that the aging rates of phenotype two is lower in all of the, uh, in all conditions and both wild type and ATPA, which means that the cells are actually changing their phenotype so that they can lower their aging rate. And this is how they're adapting to the environment. And so this is my last, slide where I want to summarize everything that I said. Um, so we, uh, so here we try to find a, um, a connection between uh, nutrient availability and the gene dysfunction of cells. And we found that when the nutrient availability is high and there is no gene dysfunction, um, it, it, it's an uh, optimal condition where there's very low aging rate in the single cells and high growth rate. So, and this, this, this is happening for single cells and connect this, connecting this to population growth and population growth, we can see very high uh, optimal condition. Uh, when nutrient availability is high and gene dysfunction is also high, the cells can um, go through resilience through allostasis, which means that they will have a little bit of higher aging rate and a little bit of grow slow, lower growth rate com compared to the optimal condition, but they can, but um, in the population, as a population, they can adapt to this and um, they can go through a high growth rate for the population. Um, when the nutrient availability is very low and the gene index function is also low, they will have degraded resilience, which means they will have higher aging rates, lower growth rates, and they go through this phenotypic change that I mentioned, where the cells are filamenting. And when you look at the entire population, um, this is an example of what had in MNG, the higher the entire population will show um, lower growth rates. And the collapse is where there's very low no, uh, nutrient condition and high gene dysfunctions where the aging rate is very high and the growth rate is very low and the cells mostly lies and you see that the population is collapsing. And so with that, I just wanted to thank everyone. Uh, oh, and um, our manuscript has uh, recently been published. Uh, so you can um, go to this if you have any additional questions or you wanted to read more about this. And I wanted to thank everyone who uh, was uh, who helped us in this uh, project, my advisor, Hannah, uh, and uh, my co-advisor, Zoltan, uh, Amy, Alicia, Peyton, Harsh, and Asil, who um, did, each of the, them did parts of this um, project. And thank you everyone for listening.